Welcome to course number four of the introduction to ROS. Today, we're going to talk about ROS services, which are very similar to uh, ROS topics, but it's a different mechanism that you'll learn about. Then quickly, we talk about ROS actions, again, a similar concept, uh, just so you have heard about it. And we're going to talk about two important concepts, ROS time and ROS bags. And then, then we're going to talk about these debugging strategies that you can apply when writing your own code. So in comparison to ROS topics where we have a one publisher and n subscribers, a ROS service is based on a request and response communication. So it's always two nodes communicating with each other. So in this example, we have node one, the service client, he sends out the request to the service server, node two. This guy processes the request and sends back a message to response to node one and only to that guy. So we call the service server the node which provides the service and the client who asks for it per request. Service, raw services are structured very similarly to the ROS topic. Uh, so in this case, they communicate over a, a service name and the name is as an underlying service definition, which are stored instead of .msg files, now in .srv files for service. They contain a request on top, then three minuses, and then a response. I'm going to see an example in a second. And again, in the console, you can use various commands to analyze, play around with these services. For example, you can do ROS service list to list all the available services that are run, that are provided by your nodes. And you can show the type of a service the type again, ROS service type, and then the service name. You can call, and very importantly, from the console, um, if you want to check if the service server works properly, you can call a service from the console by typing in ROS service call, then the service name, and then make sure you use the tab button such that it extends automatically all the, all the arguments that you need to fill in. And then you can type in the arguments, and we'll do that together in a second. Here are two examples on the left-hand side. We have the trigger service from the standard services. Um, the request is empty, so in case you want to trigger an emergency stop, for example. Um, so the, uh, the request is empty, and on the bottom, the response would be, did it work what you wanted, the success? Then you can additionally define a message, a human-readable message, so vehicle successful emergency stop, for example. <clears throat> on the right-hand side, a little bit more complicated example, where you want to have, for example, a motion planner to compute the plan for you. The request would contain, in this case, a pose, a start pose, and a pose for the goal, and the, some tolerances on this um, path that you require. And then uh, the service server would re get this request, would calculate, would plan the path that you need, and as a response would fill in the plan, and the service client would on his request from start and position, would get back a full motion plan. Now, for people who are ready with the virtual machine, you can start up in a console number one, a ROS core, by typing in ROS core. And then open a console number two or split the window. And then we're going to run the standard um, ROS CPP to, from the ROS CPP tutorials package. So you can type in ROS run, ROS CPP tutorials, add to ins server. It's going to start up a node, which internally contains a service server, which uh, provides the <coughs> functionality to add two integers. You type in ROS run, ROS CPP tutorials, add two in server. <coughs> then open a console number three. Now we're going to analyze and call the service from the console. So if you do now ROS service list, you should see, uh, like shown on the right hand side, that there's a service now called slash add two ints. And now if you want to figure out the type, you can type in raw service type, add to ints. 
and what's going to show you that it's a type rossipp tutorial slash to int. That's the service definition of this. Now, if you want to see more details about this service definition, you can do ROS SRV for ROS service show. And then you would give it now the type, which is rossipp tutorial slash to ints. This command checks the service definition and shows you the contents of it. So in this case, it would be a 2 ints 64, A and B, the request. Then you have the three minuses to show the separation between request and response. And then you have the int 64, the sum, the result, and the response. Now from the console, you can call the service yourself by typing in ROS service call, like we saw, the service name slash add to ints, and to make sure to use the tab button. And then you can, for A and P, you can fill in two integer values. And then if you press enter, you're going to see that this runs and very quickly gets your response here. The sum out of 10 and 5 is 15. OK, now we started a node which provides a service server. And we analyze it and called it from the console. If we look at the implementation, and if you want to build your own service server, here's an example of the node that we just launched, how it looks like in CPP. So on the bottom again, we have main function, which opens a node handle and then um, opens a service server, creates an object service from the node handle and says advertise service under the name add to ints. And then you see the callback function is add. And on top, you see where this add callback function is defined. So whenever the service server is called, whenever the service is called, a request is sent out, and this callback function receives the request. And in the arguments, you see the request and the response. The request is where you get the data from, and the response is where you're going to fill in the result. So in this case, you see on top, very simply, it calculates response by saying response.sum, which is what we saw in this definition. This is wherein, um, where he's supposed to fill in the sum and says equals request A plus request B. And then it spits out some additional information. And on the very bottom, this is important. A service call can for some reason fail if you have an exception or it doesn't make sense. So typically, or you, you have to return a Boolean you see in the uh, callback function definition. So in this case, everything went smoothly, so it's going to return true. If in case the input doesn't make sense, you can also, or if it couldn't be received or something was going on, you can signal it by returning false, such that the sender, the client, the ROS service client, can know about that something went wrong. <coughs> but in this case, since everything went smoothly, you return true. Now this is for the service server. Now I'm going to look at the client. So this node, we didn't use this, but this is going to call this add to ints service. So it creates the client by using again the node handle and then uh, calling this service client, which is templated over the type rossipp tutorials to ints. And then, of course, you also have to give it the name add to ints. And then you have to cr create now the service input, right? So here it says ROSP tutorials to ints. This is the service. But then it says the request is my A, and it fills in um, the arguments, request A and B, and then calls this client that we created on top. And then finally now, since you filled in the request, you can do client call service. And then it checks you see with if if it's true or false, if it successfully received something, or signals with if it's false that failed to call call service. Um, importantly, in this service, you fill in the request, but you also get back the response with 
service.response. So it's one object holding request and response. Now, ROS actions are very similar to services, but they're meant for requests that uh, take a longer time. So a service typically, you send something out, a request, and you very quickly get back a response. Now, if you want to send out a motion plan, go over there or um, analyze this image, and this takes a half an hour, you don't want to do that over service calls because they're blocking, right? You send it out, you wait, you get a response. So for these cases, we have raw actions. In comparison to service calls, actions provide you the possibility to cancel the request. So if you say, go robot over there, and in midway you decide, okay, no, I want to do something else or it should stop, you can cancel or preempt this task. And in comparison to services, you also get feedback. So if you tell the robot, go over there, you would continuously get feedback. Okay, now I've done one meter, I've done two meters, etc. So it's a back and forth between the action client, which sends out the goal and has the possibility to cancel it, action server, which sends continuously feedback before it achieves the goal and then sends the result. So if you look at a structure of an action definition, on top, similar to services, we have a goal, then again, the three minuses, and then if it's done the result, but also in between, we have this feedback, additional feedback definition. And these files, action definitions, are stored in dot .action files. Interestingly, internally, actions are implemented just as simple ROS topics, but this is a mechanism facilitating this back and forth between an action client and an action server. Here are two examples for an action definition, and the one on the left is a simple averaging mechanism. So you would tell it, here are my samples and get me back this, the average, um, or give me back the mean and the standard deviation. So the result would be uh, two floats saying, okay, this is the mean of your samples and the standard definition. Under the assumption that this would take a long time to calculate, you can get feedback on it by telling, okay, these, this is the current, these are the samples that I've used, and this is the current mean and the standard deviation that I've calculated from your goal. And on the right hand side, similar to what I said, go robot there, you would have a follow path action, which the goal for you sent robot would be the path. And the result in the end would be success. Yes, I made it there or not. But in the feedback, you would see, okay, I get the remaining distance out of, this was the initial distance and I get the remaining distance. How far is the robot come out of the total distance he has to go? Okay. Now we talked about your ROS parameters and we talked about ROS topics and now we saw services and brushed on actions. Um, I want to compare these two a little bit in for which cases should be used what. So for parameters, you saw that we defined things like topic names, queue sizes, um, calibration files, etc. So parameters are really good for uh, constant parameters that can be defined globally. So constant settings that remain during the runtime of your robot. Now, we didn't talk about dynamic reconfigure. I just included it um, for completeness sake. In this case, this would be parameters that you can change during runtime. Although they're typically meant for one node for specific parameters, such as if you have a controller that you want to tune while it's running, you can have these tuning parameters that you can run through dynamic reconfigure. And there's actually, actually a GUI, a user interface, which allows you to easily change these parameters. So they're really good for parameters that change during runtime. It's a little bit more complicated to implement, um, but it's good if you want to tune something and then maybe later store it as a normal parameter. Then we have seen topics. It's a continuous stream of data from one topic publisher to N subscribers. So it's a one-way communication of continuous data. And it's really good if you have sensors, images, the robot state, etc. And then we've seen services, which are a blocking call. So you send out the request, then wait, and then get back the response. And this is really good for short triggers and calculations, such as emergency stop or 
change um, from running to walking, etc. And finally, we have seen actions, which are the longest of these methods. So it's a non-blocking call. You send out the goal, and then you can get feedback. You can multi-thread this, and you can preempt or cancel what you've been doing. So this is really good for task, execution, robot actions, such as robot go over there, navigation, or if you pick up this object or do this motion. So tasks that run over a longer period of time. <coughs> Now, one important concept is the ROS time, which you have automatically already used in your system. I just want to talk a little bit about it, about the concept behind ROS time. So normally, when you run your PC, ROS uses your CPU time, the system clock, which in the ROS language, it's called the wall time, because it's kind of like the real time that's on the wall. Now, for simulations, or if you have a back file, a playback of log data, that it's convenient if you want to slow down or speed up your simulation, or if you want to pause the playback of your log data. For these cases, ROS publishes the time on the topic slash clock. Now, in order to tell your nodes if that you should use this wall time, the real time, um, versus the one which comes, for example, from simulation, you have to tell it with a ROS parameter. And you do so by saying ROS param set and then set this use sim time to true. And this was already done for you when you use Gazebo. It automatically sets this for you when you start it. And um, we're going to see in one second, if you do ROS backs, if you use the option minus minus clock, it also provides you the time from the log data. Now, importantly, once you start working with timing your C++ codes, to take full advantage of this feature of simulated in real time, you should always, when you use time, use the ROS time APIs. So for example, there's a time object on so the ROS time. If you have um, start time here, begin equals ROS time now. And internally, this one would figure out itself if it should use the simulated time or the wall time. And then there's a bunch of helper methods such as to sec for to get out the seconds from this time. Same applies for durations. If you want to specify, run this for 0.5 seconds, or we already saw in a lot of examples, this rate object, which allows you to trigger something at 10 or n hertz, in here example, 10 hertz. If in case you really need the wall time, even though you're in simulation world, <clears throat> then you can still specify it explicitly by telling it ROS wall time. You have this option, also for duration and rate, wall duration, wall rate. But typically, in most cases, you would use the simple objects, ROS time, ROS duration, and ROS rate. I already talked very quickly about ROS backs. I mentioned it. ROS backs are essentially a format for logging. So it's to store message data in a binary format. And typically, uh, they're signaled with this dot back format. So you cannot open them in a text editor since it's binary format, but you can read them with several tools. And it's a really convenient tool um, for recording data from your robot or your simulation, such that later you can analyze them, archive them, or play them back on your PC and see what happened with my robot. Now, like I said, you can record ROS packs yourself by telling ROS back record and the simplest version would be minus minus all. This option would tell it, recall all the topics that are run on my system. If you want to record only certain topics, you can do ROS back record and just give it a list of those topics that you want to record. And you would see the recorder would start up and you can stop it by pressing control C in the console that you open to record it. And then the bags, once you stop it, are stored where you open, where you started recording under by default under a date and the time. So here 2017, blah blah blah, and the time.bag. Once you have this bag file that you recorded, you can play it back, or you can first look at information and say to show information about it, you can do ROS back info and then the bag name that you just recorded 
and it will show you the contents, how many messages of which type are stored in this bag. To play back, to read this file and play it back, you can say ROS bag, play, and then the bag name that you recorded. And there are several options that you can specify when you play back a bag file, such for example, minus minus rate, where you can define how fast I want to play this. If you want to slow it down by half, you would do 0.5. With this minus minus clock, it's important, typically you want to do that if you want to have further tools that depend on the time that you recorded in your ROSPAC. So by telling ROSPAC play, um, and then the minus minus clock, it will take the time from the ROSPAC and also publish it. So you can have an algorithm, you record some raw data, and have an algorithm work as if it would get data from the real robot and with the same time that it was originally recorded. So you can, it's very convenient if you have a real robot, record a bunch of raw data, and then later refine your algorithms, figure out um, how do I have to optimize my algorithm such that it works on the real robot. Now here quickly about debugging strategies when you develop and work with ROS or in general with CPP. Um, these are a couple of things that you can go through and practice yourself to debug your code. So first I want to talk about tools that you've already learned in this course. So what you have to do is make sure to compile your code often. After some changes, some major changes, uh, where you're not 100% sure if this is going to work, compile and run your code, see what happens, and make sure that you catch bugs early during development. If you code for two hours and try to compile, it would be very hard uh, to get things to run because you're going to do a lot of mistakes, and one mistake will do another mistake, so it's going to be very hard to track down these bugs if you don't find them early. <clears throat> if you compile or run your code and you get an error, read the error message very specifically. Often it will exactly tell you on which line what happened. So don't just say, okay, there's an error, I don't know what it is, try to read it. I agree often it is hard, sometimes error messages don't make sense because it's also hard for the compiler to analyze these messages. But if there's a message, make sure, try to understand the compiler what it tries to do so that you can get a feel for what do I have to look if I get this error message. And once your notes are compiling and running, but they don't show data or something doesn't work, uh, make sure that your data flow is correct. For this, we learned tools like ROS node info, check on, is the subscriber actually running? On which topic is it subscribing? Is my service client doing the right thing? Can I call it from the console? You can do ROS topic echo. What's the content that my node is delivering? Why doesn't Arvis show something? How should Arvis show something if the content is all zero? Right, you can already see this from the console. And there's a tool, ROS WTF, to kind of analyze what's going on in your system. And of course, like we saw, Arcute graph, where you would see the layout of your nodes and how they're interconnected. If you have two nodes not connected, you know uh, that something, the data flow is not correct. It often is very convenient and helpful to visualize your data. Uh, you already, um, in the exercise, you used a marker to show your estimation of the pillar in the world. So this is one example where you wouldn't spit out X and Y coordinates because often it's hard to see them. So you would, um, especially in 3D and involving rotations and motions, typically it's very convenient to visualize things in Arvis for you to make sure that the algorithm does the things that you expect it to do. And today we're going to talk about another tool uh, where you can also plot 2D data similar to MATLAB to analyze your algorithms. Then when you develop, make sure to split up your code into smaller steps. So if I have a big problem, divide it first, I'm going to do this, I test this, if it runs, I go to the next one. Don't from the beginning start to tackle the whole thing, because it's going to be very hard to write everything at once correctly. And then once you have these steps, you can check intermediate results. Uh, for example, like we saw by logging data, such as ROS info, you can use a ROS debug um, command. And this will allow you to check continuously, are the, is the code doing what I want, and build up complexity over time. Then make sure to make, once you know it runs, and somebody else might do this, or yourself at a later point, make sure it's robust. Like what happens 
check if the arguments are all not a number values, all nuns, or they're all zeros, or uh, make sure that you catch exceptions if TF could not convert your frames, etc., such that your code becomes robust to use. And if things stop making sense and the compiler doesn't do what it should, and um, you can do, sometimes it's helpful to just clean your environment to build up from scratch again. You can do that by catkin clean minus minus all. This will delete your build and devil folder so you can compile from scratch again. This is often useful if you rename a bunch of things and there's caching information, uh, which is old and things don't work together. It's good to clean and um, build up from scratch again. Now with these tools, you'll get very far. But in the future, if you're interested, there's a bunch of other tools that you can learn too. You can, we saw that we now always built in release mode. We already set this up in the virtual machine for you in the catkin configurations. You can build in the debug mode by specifying CMake build type debug. This is useful if you want to go step by step through your code. And then you can use the tools like GDB or Volgrind to, if you have an exception, to catch it and show you where did this happen in my code. The same thing you could do in Eclipse. If you run your node through Eclipse and build in debug mode, you can go in debug, set breakpoints, and go step by step through your code if really necessary. And finally, it's a good practice to maintain your code by a set of unit tests or integration tests. So unit tests would be, I have this method, I know what it's doing, and I can build a test to it. It's a separate class, which in runtime wouldn't hurt you, but if you want, you can run this tester method, and you would call this class and check if I give this input, what happens to the output. So in, that's, in this case, if you have multiple users or programmers working on the same code, you can make sure that your code doesn't break because somebody changed something. By running your test, you can prove it's still doing the same thing. Everything is fine. And same goes for integration tests. If you have a complex system, you can build these ROS integration tests. And we'll see some of those in the use case on Thursday. Um, where you run essentially the whole robot, entire algorithms, and check is the robot actually doing what I want. So you don't have to do this manually. You can automate it on the server, etc., to make sure that if you work in a big group, your code is healthy and it works. So in the future, um, if you do your own project, we encourage you to use native Ubuntu because out of performance reasons. And we put down a manual on the very bottom of this course website, which says setting up a developer's PC, which gives you a PDF, where we described what were the steps that we did on the virtual machine, such that you can configure your own PC very, or exactly the same as you were used to here from the course natively on your own Ubuntu. So if you do a coursework, check out this manual to set up your PC. Here again, um, the links for further reference, and with that, I'm at the end of course four. And this was all the theory that you're going to learn about, Ross. And next time we'll have the case study. <coughs> then we'll have Martin giving you the introduction to exercise four. And we will start with the RQT multiplot. And for this, we will uh, plot the pose in the, uh, the position of the robot in the XY plane. So. First, um, just as info, what we have used so far to get the position of the robot. So always in the background, in the simulation, there was already running a ECAF localization node, which takes a, which can takes different inputs. In our case, it takes the velodometry of the robot and the IMU as input and gives you out the, um, uh, the pose and the velocity of the robot. So if you run the simulation, you can either run the simulation from exercise one or two, where you have the teleop um, twist keyboard node as input. So I run the simulation with the teleop twist keyboard node. And if we see what is running here, there's already a uh, Extending the Kalman filter node running. So here is the ECAF localization node running. And 
and if we check what this node is doing, this cross node info, <coughs> you can see this node is subscribing to the velodometry from Husky Velocity Controller Odom into the IMU data. And it's publishing and what is this pub publishing is the the husky odometry it's uh, it's um, pose and its velocity it's also publishing the transform between the odometry frame which is your uh, map frame in arvis and the base link of the robot so now we want to uh, plot this position of the robot. For this, you have already pre-installed the RQT multiplot. I will run it here. You can run it with Rostron RQT multiplot. To get more information about the multiplot tool, there's also a link on the exercise. Here you can see the, the multiplot. And if you want to add a plot, you can here configure one. Give it a title, so let's call it Husky Position. And then add a curve to the plot. So that will be the XY position. As you have seen before, the position is, is published under the topic, Automatically Filtered. So you can use RQT Multiplot basically to visualize any arbitrary message you want. You can see there are, are all the messages. They're right now published. You can, it does depend what type it is. So here you have the x-axis. Then you can choose the field. A bit hard here. <laughs> yeah. How much is in this here? That's a bit too small on the screen. Um, yeah, you can on your screen you can see that there's a the choice you can have. So I have to type it here because I can't see it. So what we want to plot is the position. On the x-axis we plot the x position. And on the y-axis, we plot the y-position. Now I can st uh, start running the plot. And yeah, I have to do it. Now I will drive a bit with the husky. I can show it both on the same screen, unfortunately. And then if I go back to the RQT multiplot, you can see the path that the Husky covered so far. So, um, and then we can save this configuration if you want. So it will, um, this configuration will be loaded the next time you start the RQT multiplot. So we will place it somewhere in your workspace. You can save this configuration. <coughs> so we have plotted the, the path of the simulated task key. The next step, we want to do this for the recorded data. For this purpose, we provide you with a, a ROSPEC file. You can find it on our website and download it from here. It's this file. I already downloaded it because it's 160 megabytes and put it into the download folder. Your task for this exercise um, will be to, to run the same extended Kalman filter node that is already running in simulation. Um, there's also a link provided on the exercise file 
sheet where you can find some information about the, this ECAF node. But basically what you need is that you have the same configuration as in simulation. And you can find the configuration file <coughs> that was used in the package husky control in the folder config. There's already a configuration file localization with the parameters you have to provide to the extended command filter node. So there are already the, the important parameters, so it will give you the transform between the autumn and the base link frame. As I mentioned before, it takes the, uh, the reloadometry as input. Here's the configuration, how it will be feeded into the common filter, and it takes also the IMU data as an input. So basically, you have to use the same um, YML file and load it to the parameter server. I have already prepared a launch file. that is running this um, filter. So if you check what is running here. And it's also subscribing as before to the same topics. So I need some more space. Now I want to plot the same um, the same position as before for the recorded data. So I start again the, the RQT multiplot. You can see the the configuration is saved before is still here as a default configuration. And then I will go to the back file, which is saved in the folder <coughs> downloads. And I will play it. Important here is that you use the flag minus minus clock. So now the back file will, um, will publish its time. And I set the parameter, use sim time to true. It's very important. It's also a hint on the exercise sheet that you set it to true. So the other nodes, like the extended common filter, know that they have to listen to the simulated time. So if I play the back file, I have also the start um, plotting here. Um, another tip is if you press space, you can start and stop um, playing the back file. So now you can here see the position on the recorded data. We recorded the data ourselves with a Husky robot um, that we have in the lab on a large field. You can see here the path. Additionally, because we don't have any more the GUI from the gazebo simulation, we should visualize the data in RVs. For this, um, you can use the TF, so you can see how the frames are moving. And you can also use the robot model. Um, so far, the robot model was um, lo loaded to the parameter as soon as you launched Gazebo simulation. Now you have to load it by yourself to the parameter server, the robot description. But you can find how it's done in the, in the package Husky Gazebo in the launch file spawnhusky.launch. It's also written on the exercise sheet where you can look it up. Um, I will relaunch this one. Now that we have the localization of the robot from the um, recorded data, I can also show you. That's what uh, it should uh, look like in the end. That's the travel path of the recorded Husky robot. So. This back file not only 
and type ROS back info, you can see what this backhaul contains. It not only contains the same pilotometry and IMU data as the simulated robot, it also contains some laser data which you can visualize as soon as you have the localization of the robot. Because this um, laser data is in, the, in respect, to, respect to the robot. So if we restart here. can see what it's publishing here. It's also publishing a point cloud. It's from a Velodyne laser uh, Velodyne LiDAR. So it's not only a single laser scan as we have from the laser sensor we used so far, but it provides you with a whole 3D point cloud. So now I'll play the back. can see here the whole point cloud. I will maybe increase a bit the size of the dots. <coughs> so this is how this is how it should look like. Um, the localization of the robot, the visualization and also the laser data visualization. Visualization uh, in respect to the robot.